I actually called a turkey expert today, my mother, just before we had this conversation to find out about some of the things we make. So good for you. Oh, thank you. And uh, she knows when the phone rings because, you know, it's a day ahead and she's like, what is it? Which one? <laughs> well, my, my mother does the same thing. She's like, what are you calling about? Are you calling about a meal or how to spell your middle name? I'm like, I don't you know. Because I understand I'm still a man with the pork fat baby back balloons. G'day, y'all, and welcome to episode nine. That voice you heard was David Turpin. He loves being amongst friend, uh, friends and family at Thanksgiving, mostly friends now that he has uh, immigrated. Um, I've been lucky enough to share a few with David. And also, we have got Phil Bertino. Welcome. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, Barbara. Bright and sunny today. Well, not too sunny, but sunny for Melbourne. It's sunny enough. Um, I've packed up the thanks or the uh, Halloween decorations. I need to get out the Thanksgiving decorations. Um, have you? Uh, did you lose any money on the horses? No, I gave up on those uh, ponies. Uh, probably about three or four years ago, I stopped betting on Cup Day because it just was too many horses, too many decisions, too much disappointment. Just drink. Yeah, no, it's, you know, I, we actually, it was very, we didn't pay any attention to it this year. So we've, we've done that. I'm, I'm looking ahead to, uh, you know, as I say, getting the Thanksgiving decorations out and prepping. And um, I noticed the Christmas decorations are out. I think everyone is so excited to have some good news. And by the end of this year that um, we're celebrating a little bit early. Yeah. And I think that New Year's Eve is going to be sensational because people just want to quit this year goodbye (laughs) they do they want to get the heck out of dodge um we're also looking forward to you know the whole holiday season is you know we grew up where it would be chilly it'd be sweater weather you know you'd be inside around a fireplace maybe or just you know with some hot toddies and things but you know here it's spring so it's sort of a different feel it's like barbecue season is happening and finally we've been able to uh, be out of lockdown and people are roaming the beaches and having coffees and all those lovely things but it's still cold here i mean today we're, we're only getting to 15 so it's still a bit sweater weather but tomorrow will be <laughs> summer again Well, it is. It's Melbourne, which, you know, being from Northern California, I can appreciate four seasons in one day. We used to go to San Francisco wearing like shorts and then a sweater or a sweatshirt on top. It covered you both ways. Um, Now, today is all about Thanksgiving preparation. So we will talk about Thanksgiving in a few weeks, but now is the time to get your planning ready and work out your recipes and your shopping lists and a few things you can do early. And that's what we intend to speak about today. Now, I know you're looking up and seeing what is the fun facts that happen of Thanksgiving past. Oh, there has to be many, uh, maybe including a drunk uncle here and there, but I'm not sure. But little trivia. So yes. what happened? Tell me what happened in 1953. Oh, this is the best story of American ingenuity, I think. Um, a Swanson's employee, now Americans will know the Swanson company, food company, they over-ordered uh, turkeys. So how many? Uh, 260 tons of turkey to be exact. And they had this excess to deal with. So one of the employees decided, you know, on a plane, you get the separated plates with, you know, airplane food. So let's, we've got some aluminum trays. Let's make a thanks or turkey dinner. So the very first TV dinner was a turkey dinner. Wow. All thanks to, to someone screwed up in the ordering office. Well, 260 tons, I guess if he didn't come up with a thing to use it with and for the company to make some money on it, he would have been looking for a job. <laughs> you would have. Well, and in 1953, when this happened, they cost 98 cents. Which was quite a bit of money. That would have been like, I don't know, $8 today or nine? It, well, More? yeah, probably. And it would have opened up the, uh, you know, the whole business of making TV trays. <laughs> yeah. Remember, it, just, it used to be kind of cool. I used to really hate it when one of the peas or corn snuck over into the cobbler section in the middle. Yeah. I like the little dessert corner. So now that bit is um, just funny because that became an American 
mainstay. And I think it's kind of led its way to convenience cooking and all the freezer foods we have now. Well, we got to thank uh, Mr. Birdseye for that. Clarence Birdseye, <laughs> the inventor of uh, frozen foods. Well, that's true. Well, I wonder if he and the Swansons got together at any point. Well, that would have been probably sometime after uh, he sold his company to the lady from Post, um, the daughter who uh, for CW Post very famous woman who was the first person to take over a conglomerate, so to speak, or she made her business, her father's business in a conglomerate. And she had a lot of pushback from all the executives of Post when she, when her father passed away and she took over the business. But she ended up buying Bird's Eye and she ended up buying uh, uh, Maxwell's Coffee. And all of that went into a company called General Foods. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic. Where our, I guess it's safe to say, our former president resides in Florida. That used to be her house, Mar-a-Loma. <laughs> ah, is it Mar-a-Lago, isn't it? Mar-a-Lago, yep. <laughs> Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Loma. It's, it's mirror something. Mirror some. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> The it's well yeah the summer white house as they were calling it for a while but you know I think the another fun fact that I can appreciate uh, the night before Thanksgiving in the U S is one of the biggest days for bar sales in the entire year makes a lot of sense because most of the men want to be away from their wives or their families <laughs> or whatever on the day before because it'd just be crazy you know running to do this get that go out do that. So they're getting away from that. It's also a break, a big breakaway day. So a lot of people will finish work early because of uh, they'll stretch that holiday into a long holiday weekend. And it's also the most traveled uh, time of the year for people in America. That is the most traveled day is, I believe, the day before Thanksgiving. And they're probably a lot of them uh, are missing their flights or waiting for delayed flights and sitting at a bar in an airport. There's nothing like a bit of courage before you get on the plane at the airport. I I actually have my I had a beautiful aunt, Aunt Agnes, and um, she was the sweetest lady. And she, you know, when it was she, we had a lot of holidays there, especially Thanksgiving, Christmas. She used to have this little tiny, very feminine sort of liqueur glass, sort of parked away in the corner of the kitchen, and I'm pretty sure it had whiskey in it. I'm sure my mother will correct me if I'm. Not right with that. And occasionally she just take a little sip just to get through all the family on the day. <laughs> it's like my favorite Christmas song because Christmas and Thanksgiving always blended in together. It is uh, I'm getting drunk on Christmas. <laughs> so it, well, yes, it's the holiday season theme, I think. Now, what are some of the experiences you have with um, prepping for Thanksgiving, like U.S. versus Australia? Or, you know, we've had, we've probably had more, I've had more here than I have it back in the U.S. now. So what do you, what do you get up to? I, I get up to trying to, well, leading up to the holiday, uh, I have, my preparation is coping with the amount of lists, the notes, the reminders that I get from my wife. Make sure you do this. Could you go get that? Did you, have you done this yet? No. When are you waiting for? Well, we always wait for the last minute. It's more fun. <laughs> Do you do that just to annoy her? Uh, no, I'm, I could say it. I'm a procrastinator. I, you, know, I, sure. you do, you do your best work under pressure. Me, most of the time she leaves me notes and what note? You know, she gives me so many notes that, you know, I don't have a filing system for them. So I don't know which one is more important than the other one, you know. Oh, Phil, I think you should be paying a bit more attention. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> It ain't gonna, but it's not going to happen. Well, now let's, we're going to be talking to our guest, David. I'm going to be asking out what he does as well. So we'll, we'll be right back with David Turpin. Stoking coals soothes my soul. I love my barbecue. Understand I'm just a man with the pork fat baby back balloons. And now it's time for our guest. Thank you so much for being with us today, David Turpin. And David, I would also like to introduce you to Phil Bertino, who will be the other voice with us today. I'm the other voice, David. Oh, magnificent. <laughs> it's nice to hear from both of you. 
Yeah. Well, it'd be good. I don't know if I'll get a word in with these two New Yorkers slash Southern California guys, but I'll do my best. Um, now, David, can you please tell us the David Turpin life story in 60 seconds? No, can't even <laughs> approach it on 60 seconds. It, I have had a long, fun filled life for sure. Born, born in Buffalo. Uh, as a young adult, I sold all my belongings, drove to Los Angeles, lived there, uh, ended up meeting a girl, and she took me to Australia. A few stops along the way. So that's about. I, I don't have anything more to say about that, I guess. Here I am. <laughs> well, that, that sounds very exciting. <laughs> oh, it's, it's lively, but I, it's not how exciting it is. Well, I guess anything to get out of Buffalo. Uh, well, you know what? Honestly, I was in the rock and roll and film business, so it, I think I had to end up there eventually. Oh, back in L.A.? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, see, and, that's a and, typical entertainment person just downplaying it a bit. Well, I did start in rock and roll in Buffalo, so it's like, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> well, you know that Buffalo Springfield, how they got their name, right? Yeah. I don't, no, I'm not, I've heard about it, but I don't remember, but... I have a Buffalo Springfield album that was my dad's. Yeah, well, one was uh, because some of the founding members, one was from Buffalo, I don't know which one, and one was from Spring Springfield. Jersey, wow. Springfield, Buffalo Springfield, there you go. Little rock and roll history. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have been lucky enough to share a couple of Thanksgivings with David and his lovely wife, Sue, and little David Liam. So I know that you really love cooking and you really love the holidays. So we're trying to get some ideas together to help our listeners talk about preparation, some of our favorite recipes. Um, we all do, it, with it being such a great American holiday, we all do different things regionally as well. So what are what's like one of your family staples that we might not do or might not have heard of? Turkey? Yes, I think that might be pretty obvious. I've but... heard of that one before. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we speaking to Australia or are we speaking to the United States? Because Turkey is very hard to find here. Our, yeah. our own experience. That's all. Like um, you mentioned Turkey. And so I'll start this off. So, you know, everybody roasts Turkey. That was the traditional way. And then one year we went down to Florida uh, to see Mary Jane and Leo and Leo decided to uh, take out the fryer and make a fried turkey. The first time I ever had fried turkey. And I said to Leo, I said, you've been living down south too long. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, are you talking deep fried turkey? Deep fried turkey. Yes, I've had that. I had that in California, too. That was, it was, I loved it. It was really good. Well, I got the fry here, and I'll probably fry my turkey on Thanksgiving. Yeah. We have to re we have to tell the audience here. When I go home and have a turkey, I actually, you know, like we have big turkeys. Even if you have a family of four, you have a giant turkey. Here, when I first moved here, I used to pay about a hundred bucks for something that looked like just an overgrown chicken. Luckily, I can now now I want it so it just fits in my oven because then I feel like I've achieved something. So I I probably how much oil would you need for a deep fried twenty pound turkey? Well, I go to Costco and you buy that big box of oil. <laughs> that. And, uh, I don't know how many liters it is, but that's basically what you need. You know, I mean, the bad thing is, if, you know, you could probably recycle the oil, but it does have a date on it. You know, and so once you use it, you got You could use it again probably the next two weeks, and then it, you know, before it starts going off or rancid or whatever or breaking down because it all breaks down as you fry with it. So you try to, you know, make your deep fried turkey and then maybe a few days later do a deep fried chicken or something, you know. It, so anything that you use the oil, so I don't feel bad. I spent all this two bucks on oil and I only used it once. Well, it's a special day. It's a special day. It's a very messy process too, those uh, deep fried turkeys, right? Well, if you do it wrong, it's deadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do it near a tile floor. That's that would be crazy. Oh, uh, I can't imagine. I have a I have a hard enough time thinking my wrist is going to hold up getting the turkey pan out of the oven. I finally, after all these years, found my go to recipe for it. But I still call my mother 
every year. It's like the Bitterball Turkey line, my own personal one. Even though I know what I'm doing, I've done it for like nearly 30 years here. I still need to call and just get the, what exactly do you put in your stuffing and how long should I really do it? And so, you know, I think she's happy with that, but I still don't have the confidence to do it all. Oh my. I think that is absolutely wonderful. I actually called a turkey expert today, my mother, just before we had this conversation to find out about some of the things we make. So good for you. Oh, thank you. And uh, she knows when the phone rings because, you know, it's a day ahead and she's like, what is it? Which one? Yeah. Well, my, my mother does the same thing. She's like, what are you calling about? Are you calling about a meal or how to spell your middle name? I'm like, I don't you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, doesn't your mom have you uh, a special recipe that involves mashed potato? What's well, the tradition? Okay, I specifically called about this. We were talking about side dishes uh, mm-hmm. in like a pre-interview, and mashed potatoes were one of the sides we talked about. And I said, we also had a mashed potato recipe or something on the side that was unusual. So it wasn't mashed potatoes, but it had potatoes in it. Right. So, so what it happened to be is this really decadent... Uh, dish made with hash browns, sour cream, cornflakes, uh, processed cheese whiz, and f- <laughs> wait, wait, it gets better. Fun- I bet. Funyuns are on top of it, and then it's all baked, and somehow you, it, I mean, it's absolutely delicious. I think there's also been bacon bits on top of it at one point. <gasps> but uh, it, that would be it, like a molten goodness. This is like one of those you don't talk about it, but it's delicious kind of meals. You don't like, you're not at a state dinner going, you know, did you have my uh, mother's turpin potatoes? Oh, no, no, you don't talk about it, but everybody wants it because it's, it's white trash at its finest. Oh, I love, I love a bit of white trash cooking because, you know, green bean casserole, like it's not the same if you don't put, you know, cream of mushroom soup in it. You can make the fancy homemade cream of mushroom soup all you like, but until you do it where it slops out of the can and you mix everything together, it doesn't taste right. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> now, so we can call this, if people want your your family recipe, do we want to call them turpin potatoes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. My mother, that's what she calls them, but I think that my brother-in-law has stepped them up to a different level and I'm not I don't have access to that recipe. <laughs> well, well, we'll stick with the original. That's fine. <laughs> no, now, we'll, have, we'll have to get a link for that. On the- <laughs> <laughs> I do. Well, what I do, because here, as you know, I do mine on a Thursday night. I stand firm with that one um, because I just carry the tradition on and I take the day off work and I bake for our cook for about a week ahead so one of the things i can do earlier is i make my pie crusts ahead of time and then either freeze them in the pie tin or um you know just have them in little discs that i can roll out but i do want to say with people making pies if they decide to follow an american recipe if it calls for a stick of butter that's half of an australian stick of butter that's oh, yeah. the one measurement we've got right here <laughs> <laughs> Where well, you, you guys are culinary here in Australia. Sorry? Where do you find sticks of butter here in Australia? Well, you buy a 250 gram stick of butter, Phil. When's the last time you went shopping? Well, yeah, but that's like four sticks, ain't it? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. That's it. We're taking a field trip to the store. I will show you. All right. But, but my, um, my pie crust recipe takes two American sticks, so I'm easy. I just throw 250 grams of butter in and do the rest. Yeah, speaking of pie crust, that's one of my to-do things. I have to bring home pie crust today, you know, the frozen one. We don't. Jeanette doesn't. Uh, thank God she doesn't make her own. But oh, Philip, wow, I'm not going there. Anyway, but that's one of my to-do things. We talked about <laughs> that before. All right. Yeah, Phil and I were talking earlier. Um, there's different pies that you know we do, and one of those things to think of head is you know we do pumpkin pies. But if people here don't have access to, to us or don't want to use a butternut pumpkin, I, I also do a sweet potato pie that comes from my um, stepdad's family. And that's, an, that's a really good alternative because you can get, you know, get sweet potatoes here and do that. Can I recommend something? Please do. This is for the listeners. If you don't have access to Barbara's pies, then by any means necessary, try to get access to them because you are an amazing uh, dessert maker of, and it's just exceptional. 
So oh, that- you are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. You are now my favorite. Well, I already Sorry. told Barbara to uh, make sure that we, she gets her sweet potato pie recipe up online for our listeners because pumpkin is in very, very tight supply this year because of COVID and for a number of different reasons. And it's not just us bringing it in into Australia, it's even in the U.S. where they're really suffering to uh, find pumpkin around. Oh, wow. Well, I will come up with an alternative. It's from it's Aunt Odessa's sweet potato pie. So we will we will do that as well. And uh, that brings us to another thing that I do. Sometimes I'll roast my um, sweet potatoes to make um, my candied yams. I'll do those ahead because I can, you know, you can do those several days ahead before Thanksgiving. And that's sort of handy. Actually, my daughter told me yesterday, I said, what's your favorite part of Thanksgiving? And she goes, I like it when we sit down to eat because you are so intense all day long. It's the first time you enjoy yourself. So I might wow. have to apologize. <laughs> so, hey, Barbara, of- and David, on your sweet potato casserole, which everybody, I think, makes, and there's some people that use mini marshmallows and some people who just use like a brown sugar on top of it. Which, which do you use? Oh, just so you know, my family never had sweet potato casserole. Uh, I would have adopted that in Los Angeles because I had some friends. Actually, my friend uh, Felisa, she Valesquez, who is the coach's lead designer for Coach, she introduced me to sweet potato uh, casserole. And everything she did was in that 50s, 60s martini vibe. So it absolutely had marshmallows, if not colored marshmallows. (laughs) And she was a very good cook too. I mean, she's amazing. So, oh, that's it. I do. I do the marshmallows on top. Yes, and, and I have to. And it's every year. It's a race not to burn it under the grill. That's my thing. Now, when you were on the phone to your mom today, did she have any other tips for you for uh, Thanksgiving, or well, did you cover anything else? Well, we were just going over what normally happens at our Thanksgivings because my mother was predominantly for the family, the one that would make the bigger meals for uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas. And on Christmas, we'd always have a roast. And on Thanksgiving, we'd always have turkey. However, one thing that I think I've adopted from my mother is that we had many cousins and uncles and people that didn't like turkey. So she would make them what they would like. So I can remember like my cousin having hot dogs for one Thanksgiving, just to give an example, (laughs) because Thanksgiving is more about just getting together and giving thanks and just having a great meal. So although we've all adopted our, the processes probably for our parents and then maybe even like made them ours, uh, my family is just about giving and having a good, good time so that's all that's what i've always concentrated in the hospitality part of it well that's true it's nice and i i have shared thanksgivings with phil and jeanette as well and extended family and it's really nice just to sit there and um you know think about the people that you're thankful for think about you know especially this year sometimes you're going to have to hunt through a little bit more but those good things are even more special this year than others um (laughs) And and I my favorite part of Thanksgiving is that it is the one holiday that you do get together or you try to with your family. You might spend Christmas skiing or going somewhere else, but Thanksgiving you always try to get home, you know, and be and be with family. And and then when you move away, you kind of make your own family here as well with friends, which is which is really important. And it makes all that food prep even more special because it's, you know, a real act of love rather than an act of, oh my God, it's December 23rd. Everyone's coming over. Right. (laughs) Christmas is under too much pressure, you know, and Thanksgiving is just, it's an open invitation, you know, just to get together. That's exactly right. I I had a friend in California, Larry, and he used to go out on Thanksgiving while his wife was uh, preparing the meal with and bringing all the family over. And then always come home with a stray, not a stray dog, a stray person that was a street person or live some bum living in the street or whatever. Put him in his car and bring him home for for a meal. That is, 
That's so nice and unusual because in Thanksgiving, we always used to bring in all the stray people we know that didn't have ability to go to their families. So we, I always had a gathering of people who couldn't get home because I couldn't get home. Was from yeah. The, in Los Angeles to Buffalo is very expensive during those times in my life. So, And there's no, yeah, there's no orphans on Thanksgiving. Yeah, right. And you don't want to go from California to Buffalo in November because of the weather. Right, because I have been stuck in a freak's early snowstorm doing that, just that. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've only had to deal with Northern California. I was spoiled. We only had to get through the fog from uh, one relative to the next. I, was, I always found myself very lucky being the divorced kid because I got two Thanksgivings, two Christmases, two birthdays, two Easters. So we go from one house to the other. So, you know, I got all the, all the Thanksgiving food on one day. Oh, that's really nice. And your family's lovely too. Your mom and your Phil is that your dad, your stepdad? They were just Herman. Were... My stepdad uh, Herman. Herman, Herman. Well, actually, speaking of Herman and Thanksgiving, he um there is this classic story where there was the Thanksgiving turkey that started off in the Weber. I think they had it the next day or the next yeah. day. I can't remember how long it took, but uh you know, by hook or by crook it was gonna finish in that damn Weber. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we also, when you talked about the hot dogs, I had an um, an aunt, Blynn, who is a very, you know, she's picky. She was, she was a bit of hard work, Aunt Blynn. And we always had to have ham for her because she didn't like turkey. So mom would get a spiral ham and do that at Thanksgiving as well. But I think she was the only one that really took on that uh, that second meal. But if you knew Aunt Blynn, that's very her. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, now, girl, actually. An Italian household. Uh, on Thanksgiving, I think I mentioned once before, my grandmother said this is an American holiday. It's only American food. But we always had uh, more than one meat on the table. Of course, there was a the grand thing of having the turkey. But a lot of times, because Italians just like to cook, they would have to make a roast beef or a ham or something else because it was never enough. You know, 22 pound turkey. It's not big enough. You know, <laughs> 26 of us. Yeah. I, I don't know if Barbara got the experience of Italian cooking in California, but I dated an Italian girl in Buffalo and I just went for a regular meal and there was like 10 meals. Yeah. <laughs> and then you got your pre's and then I, your early, you know, a little pastina and the feud goes on. Yes. How many days does Thanksgiving last in uh, Italian Thanksgiving? Well, actually, I think in any household, Thanksgiving does last until the turkey runs out. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, a week after, you know, because you're having, uh, you know, turkey sandwiches and turkey pie and turkey. Well, meat. leftover. OK, is it is this a universal thing when everybody gets leftover turkey and they just put it on two pieces of white bread? And that's yeah. it. Right. Actually, well, I used yeah. to make I used to make Brendan a Thanksgiving sandwich that had turkey stuffing, sweet potatoes and cranberry sauce and a bit of congealed gravy because it was cold yeah. then. And it yes. was like this big, giant Dagwood sandwich. And he'd take two of those to work. And he was, and I usually got a call later on in the day going, thank you so much for that. Wow. Two sandwiches. <laughs> and he's not a big boy at all. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> he would like that. I will pass that on. And Phil had a recipe. I don't want to miss out because we're talking about recipes today. So I don't want to miss out the side dishes. Phil has some mushrooms that he does or his family does. Yeah, my mom used to be the mushroom lady. So my mother's Australian by origin. And at the time, used by mushrooms in a three pound, uh, would be a wood type little basket at the uh, at the supermarkets. So she used to do that. And her thing, because she could hardly get into the kitchen when my aunts were cooking and stuff, they took over. But they let her make the mushrooms. So she used to boil the mushrooms up uh, with just some water and I think a little bit of salt in it, drain it, and then add a uh, little bit of tomato and onions into it and probably a little bit of seasoning. And then it, it, it was sort of like a saute. And it was just beautiful. It was just tasty. The mushrooms had a real strong mushroom taste to it. And it just accomplished with the tomatoes and the onions just to blend it all together. And oh, that sounds so good. It sounds like, what is that word for like very earthy and Moorish? And yeah, what? exactly. Earthy. That's a good word for it because the mushrooms you get now are so cultivated. And back, you know, in the day when I was younger, 
they just had more flavor to them. At least I, th- you know, I think they had more flavor to them. It just appears that way. Well, we hey. had those. I was lucky enough to have a, a little lunch with you guys this year, and the mushrooms were on the table. They were really good. That was a really nice addition. I'm the only mushroom eater at my house at the moment, so I, I could just make it for me. That would be a point. Until I worked in the restaurant industry, I was a, a server. Uh, I didn't even like mushrooms as a kid, but mushrooms done well are just so amazing. Like that that meal he just described, Phil just described, it just sounds so good. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be a nice addition. Now, now going back to the uh, white trash side dishes. Now, I know Jello salads are a bit controversial. So instead of a Jello salad at Thanksgiving, I make a version that is absolutely nothing near a Waldorf salad, but it's our trashy version of it. So it's apples, celery. I use pecans because I'm allergic to walnuts, um, and then mini marshmallows pineapple chunks and then i make a dressing out of mayonnaise sour cream and the pineapple juice and salt and salt and do that and that's our little ode to the um white trash side oh i like the little hat tip to you guys hey (laughs) that's right that's like you know it's along with my cream and mushroom soup in my green bean casserole it's the same thing it's like when you go to whole foods and you go down the white trash aisle it's all very pricey (laughs) Yes, we became fancy. <laughs> so, yes, I think you go shopping for the white trash stuff at the the dollar uh, with Dollar General. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Phil has a yeah. Phil doesn't have a good relationship with gelatin salads. He's got the uh, the uh, Kansas side of the family shocked him into it one time without telling him it. it had what was it? Miracle Whip on top of it. Yeah, and I just spoke with Rachel and. We're talking about because I never really had a traditional Midwestern or outside of an Italian Christmas. And what's the difference between what you serve at Christmas as opposed to what you serve at Thanksgiving? Being in Australia, they serve the turkey at Christmas here because there is no Thanksgiving. Um, and I don't know why, because 20 other, I think there's 26 other countries celebrate uh, some form of Thanksgiving, meaning to give thanks, as we you mentioned before, Barbara. Yep. So it's it's a nice holiday, but then again, we do have, uh, what did we have last week? Happy Day or something? And thank you, Day. Thank you, Day. Happy Day. Thank you, Day. Because I'm saying Happy Day happy day's coming up next Saturday at McDonald's. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, like, for... Yeah, just to let you know, so you get prepared and it all goes to, to charity for their, uh, for their happy homes. So... Where was I? I lost my train of thought now. Uh, no, you were talking about Rachel because um, she was helping you this morning talking about the different Midwest. Yeah. So on C- Christmas Day, ham is traditional that they serve there in the Midwest, along with the sides. And a lot of sides are sort of what you do also for Thanksgiving, including stuffing. And I said to her, but there's no, you know, it, there's no turkey. So what are you making stuffing for? But they do make stuffing. So as a side, and cranberries, because cranberries go quite nicely with ham. And they still make the jello mold salads. Yum. Ooh, I Yum. thought that died in 1972. But no. it's still alive and well. Now, I'm going to make you a nice Watergate salad. I am going to get the pistachio pudding, and we shall do that. We should have a jello pudding or a jello salad buffet one day. Hey, I could I ask a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, no, go ahead. I, I don't want to go away from the stuffing thing because I have a really, I would like to know the insight to stuffing because I have always traditionally for many years stuffed the bird. I love the stuffing from it. But at one point in your life, you learn like you might kill everybody. Yes, yeah, so, Seminole is not our friend. So I have always made the, the additional pan or pans of stuffing underneath. But when I get a chance, I do mix the stuffing from the bird in if it ah. looks good. What do you guys do? Well, I do, actually, this is a, a, if it's in a pan, it's dressing. If it's in the bird, it's stuffing. So it could be the same thing, but because you're not stuffing it into th- anything, it becomes dressing. So I have been told. Oh, okay. And I, I also had, when living in Los Angeles, where I probably made my most Thanksgivings, we had a lot of people that were not like pescatarians and who just only eat fish or like vegetarians or gluten-free people. So I sometimes just make them a dressing just specifically for them that wasn't contaminated by the other stuff. (laughs) Have you ever had that? (laughs) 
we do I do a cornbread um dressing and I think I've given the recipe away my mom's recipe away here um at work heaps but um Brent, I think Brendan can tell you his favorite part of Thanksgiving is coming down the stairs because in a whole stick of Australian butter, so that's 250 grams of butter, I will saute a couple of onions some ce- and some celery and get that, you know, sweat that down. And the whole house just smells like Thanksgiving. It's so beautiful. beautiful. And then I don't know what, well, Phil might, Phil will probably do it a bit differently than I do. I um, make cornbread a couple of weeks earlier and then I, oh, sorry, a week earlier. And then I chop it up and sort of dry it out. So I have oh. stale and then I add, you know, like the old song, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. And, wow. um, I just keep going with, you know, chicken stock and, um, that, and if I need to top it up, I might get some, you know, some dried, uh, some croutons or just chop up some French, like French bread and toast it and stick that. So that's pretty much the basis of it. And what do you do, Phil? Well, to saute, my mother does the saute. Jeanette doesn't saute, and that, that's an argument in my house. <laughs> but my mother used to always saute just like you did with the butter mm-hmm. and start adding, and you get that beautiful smell once you start putting the, the stuffing mix into, into the pan, into the skillet, and all the fragrances come out. But yeah. for Thanksgiving, you know, always, you know, chopped up chicken or what you used to if you get uh, turkey gizzards and a little bit of that so you get that in there and that gives you a little bit of uh meat into it and crunch but also chestnuts oh oh yeah chestnut season here in america is chestnut season and you put chestnuts in you you cut them up into like four pieces and you put it into your stuffing mix and that just just adds to it oh that'd be great that'd be like the crunch from the celery sort of like you know, if you put it in a bird, my favorite part was what was sticking out because that's, you know, my thing with crunchiness. But Mary Jane, my sister-in-law, she does, she makes her stuffing in muffin pans. And of course, so everybody has their own separate stuffing, but they're all crunchy, you know? So I guess the, I try to get the recipe from her. Oh, but then she's going on. It's about the secret family recipe, but, but <laughs> not from somebody on Leo's side of family, I think that died 28 years ago. So I don't think they will mind. But anyway, <laughs> so my thing is, if you make your stuffing, put it in, into big size stuffing uh, pans, you know, in, into that, and then put some butter on top of it as probably halfway through the cooking cycle, and then it will melt, and that will get your the extra crunch. Okay. That sounds like I'm going to have to maybe try that. I do a little bit. I, we do fight for the corners in the, in the uh, dressing pan. Do you, what do you do, David? Do you follow the same sort of thing? Do you go cornbread or do you go sourdough or what do you do? First of all, I just want to say every time I listen to Phil, I'm like, my mind is blown. I like the whole idea of a muffin and uh, stuffing in a muffin cup. I'm like, I'm stealing that. Sorry. Uh, well, that's what it's here. That's what we're doing this for. They people get people ready and say, oh, maybe I could find some chestnuts or maybe I could now look, get that muffin pan that I haven't used in 16 years <laughs> and use it for something. Oh, it just sounds so smart. I am nothing like, it sounds like either one of you with the planning or the, I I cook by sort of feeling most of the time. And it's just developed into recipes over the years because I've done it so many times. Uh, as far as when I make stuffing, I'm doing things like, I start with like you guys do. I'll sweat some onions and some garlic in a pan with olive oil. And I might add, I don't add stock at that point because I know what's going in there are going to be wet products like apples and pears and either maybe raisins or yeah. cranberries or something like that. And yeah. then as far as my crunch, I love the fact that you were doing making your own cornbread croutons a week before, which it might take a month before that to even get corn products in Australia. I've I've had like... I've gone shopping and said, oh my God, what's corn here? Oh, I find like a bag of polenta and I'm just mixing that up into a mush to make like a semi little flour, a little corn mush. And then any breads I can find like a pumpernickel or a white bread. And I just rip them up into little pieces, throw those into the pan, put lots of butter in because it's Thanksgiving. It's not like Italian oil day. Yeah. And they all bake together and they get wet. And then the cr- you get the, uh, keep them in the oven, uh, oven underneath the, element and then mm-hmm. you get the, the burn layer and it it usually turns out pretty good but 
I by no means have the process that both of you guys have. I'm just winging it and tasting and seeing how it goes. Well, that's why it's good going to different, you know, sharing these things with different people because you get different tastes and you get, you get to explore a little bit. I mean, like I suppose, well, Phil and Jeanette have their, you know, they're both American, so they've got their family. We have Australian partners, so it's not like we're going to the in-laws for Thanksgiving. So, you know, kind of our Thanksgiving is what we make it, I think, as well. Right. I'm not above taking any of these ideas from both of you guys, just so you know. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Now, you have, I understand that you do like chicken or poultry, like you've cooked it in a pit before, sort of like a honey. Okay. These are things I've been to. I have, as a young man, I went to a farm once out in, uh, maybe it was even upstate New York. I think we, we made a, quite a drive from where mm-hmm. I grew up. And we went to a farmer's house. Maybe he even raised chickens. He was a farmer. He raised everything probably. But we went there for Thanksgiving. And we're like, where's the turkey? He had it buried in the coal pit covered with coal. So he pulled it out of like foil. And we had that. He was like in there all day, I guess, just sweating it out. And that was wonderful. That that makes me think um, my uh, my childhood bestie, Zaina, um lived lived in Maui and her school would do a big you know because it's so hot you don't want to cook that in your house her school would do a big giant pit it has just come to me as you were talking and you would drop your turkey off wrapped up and then you'd pick it up the next day wow see there you go so that's oh that's a great idea I bet you a hundred bucks my dad would have done that he was like a little barbecue mad scientist oh yeah yeah. (laughs) Yes. David, uh, you got me thinking now. Now, you're from Buffalo, and yes. you mentioned that you had to go upstate. Now, Buffalo is already upstate. <laughs> so wow. From, yeah, so how – so I guess there's upstate from upstate. How does Just that work? So, Well, first of all <laughs> – <laughs> uh, I'll just go with this. Buffalo is on the west side of New York. Yeah. Upstate would be on the north side of New York, and New York City, which is New York, downstate. is downstate and east on the ocean. So we have the Great Lakes, and you have the ocean. And to get to upstate, we both have to drive a few hours towards each other and then go up. Well, I still think that Buffalo is upstate. I think anything out of Westchester County is upstate, right? I, I think that's the New York way, yes. Yeah. Once you're over to Tappan Zee Bridge, you're gone. Uh, yeah. But, you I know, come on. I, I heard there's a rumor that you grew up in the Bronx and not really in the city. So. <laughs> well, the Bronx is one of the boroughs, you know, and so is Brooklyn. Uh, so no, Chelsea's a borough. Of, yeah, that's part of New York. So. You guys are in the suburb, really, if you're thinking about it. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, Suburbs in apartment houses. There's no suburbs in apartments. Now, just so you know, Barbara, I'm teasing him, but New York actually has the best food. New York City is my favorite of all the cities. There's three that have other cities I love that have food, but that one is just incredible. So, I was lucky enough to go once, and Brendan and I lashed out a one like full on expensive meal. But then that's when the dollar was about 50 cents. And when we got the credit card bill, Ooh, it hurt. Oh. <laughs> but we had everything from like soup to grappa at the end. And I think it was like a $500 dinner for two, <laughs> but it was magnificent. I, oh, must yeah. say. I hope to get back there again. It's been a very long, very long time, but you two boys, um, I like the uh, New York, a little bit of aggression there going back and forth, a little bit of teasing. Um, the Northern Californian sort of like hippie child in me feels a little bit hurt. <laughs> if, you're not, <laughs> if you're from New York and you're not teasing, you don't like the person. That's the whole point. Like, I know. You, you got to be able to laugh at yourself. <laughs> I know. Phil has vetted me over these years. I'm sort of used to it. Like Phil and Jeanette have trained me well. Um, now, I want to thank you so much for today. And I want to ask you, do you have any final contributions? Any like your super duper tip? Actually, do you do anything special with, I know you use a turkey bag, which we might, we do happen to have here. So can you just give us your last great Thanksgiving tip? Oh, I, I've been using turkey bags for 10 years because it's a lot cleaner. 
But mm-hmm. I make a really messy turkey because my turkey is an apple onion, a garlic apple onion upside down turkey. So it creates a lot of juice. So the Ooh. bags make it super easy that I don't have to baste it. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Can, you might be able to, um, do you think you can give us a few hints in written form we might be able to share with some people? You don't have to give all the secrets away. Oh, come on. It, no one's going to make the same turkey. The first day before, or t- a day or two before, this is the only prep I do, is I get a bunch of apple juice. If I'm squeezing it, it's apples. I might put apples and pears in, depending on how sweet or the a- apples are. And it could be any types of apples. So squeeze your own apple juice or get like fresh apple juice. And don't be afraid if they don't have it just to add like the super sugary kids apple drink and marinate the bird. Ooh. So, you know, so you marinate this bird and you put garlic in the marinade too, just because you want garlic helps permeate the meat that marinates all day. And then, it, you know, I coat everything. I actually take a, all my apple cuttings the next day and I stick them on the bird and then they go in. And if it's, if you have a lot of heat, the fire is burning them onto the bird and the skin gets really good, but it's such a juicy Turkey. It's just worked out really well. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Now, Phil, what is your final super duper Thanksgiving? Super duper. I did hear that uh, recently, not recently, last year, actually do cook your turkey upside down because uh, all the fat is on the bottom and it didn't just base itself. So that that is something to take home with. And then the other is you can never have a true American Thanksgiving without watching the Macy's Day Parade. So to do that, since Macy's Day Parade is the day after Thanksgiving here, is to go on YouTube and you'll find Macy's Day Parades from Every, you know, from the 50s all the way to current day from last year and play that while you're having dinner or waiting for things to cook and having a drink and uh, talking with your people. And it's just playing in the background. Oh, I love that. That's a good tip. That makes for happy cooking. Yeah. And it's and it just brings part of the atmosphere there is just to have that you know the the parade going on and they you know you get the whole thing from you know like channel five in new york and and they're talking about you know all the people that are on the floats and you know they they give you the history of each float coming down so it's quite good and and the other thing is on new year's day do the same thing with the rose bowl you know the rose bowl parade you know and so it's a nice day because on new year's day you're sitting around and from the big day to the night before and you could just have a nice breakfast and watch the Rose Bowl Parade from last year. Oh, well, that's beautiful. And on that note, I would like to thank you, David, for being with us today and sharing some great tips. Um, and Phil, thank you for sharing that last little, I feel all homesick now in a good way. So we will sign off at this part of um, speaking to you, David. Thank you so much for Thank you so um, much being for having it. me. It was really nice. Nice to meet you, Phil. Yeah, thanks, David. And when we come back, Phil's got the secret code for us. Okay, our secret code today is PREP. So PREP, you could use it online. You could use it for click and collect. Can't use it in the store, unfortunately. The system doesn't allow us that way. But if you come into the store, if you want things that are on the PREP, Just do a click and collect. Thank you. And you can also come down to the shop and just have a browse around the store to get some Thanksgiving goodies if you need. We've got some lovely decorations this year too, actually. And our hours are 10 to 5, Monday through Thursday. Friday, we're open 10 to 8 p.m. So you can get there after you've done after dinner, if you like. It's Saturday, 10 to 5, and Sunday from 11 to 4. And we are at 73 Cochrane's Road, Moorabbin. Our email address, if you want to get in touch with us, is podcast at usafoods.com.au. And we'd love to hear some Thanksgiving prep ideas, which we will touch back on next week because now is the season to get ready. Or maybe even some Thanksgiving disasters because we all have a story about that, I am sure. Speaking of stories, any emails this week? Oh, yes, I have. We have had a few. Now, firstly, our number one fan, Leslie. She sent a quick 
emailed to us. She had a bone to pick with both of us, Phil. Oh, no. What did I do now? As usual. Well, it was the pronunciation of beignets. How do you say it? Beignet. Well, that's not how you were saying it. Well, I- it's a- <laughs> <laughs> so she said it is a beignet. Please, you know, get that right. She she also said that her grandmother used to make fritters that she thought were fritters, and they lost the family recipe, and she went to a Cajun festival, bought a beignet, and guess what? It was her grandmother's fritters. So she must have had a neighbor from Louisiana at some point that taught her how to make them. Everybody and- makes fried dough. You know, they, they go to <laughs> San Gennaro Festival in the Zeppelins, and even at some of these street. Uh, markets over here that we have in Melbourne, there's one guy that uh, goes around and he makes Zeppelis, which are fried dough with powdered sugar on it. Uh, I, lo- I, I love a good fried dough product, especially apple fritters, but that's off the subject. Right. That would have to be a donut show, I think. Now, and also I talked to my mother this morning. Uh, she gave us a review on the show. She quite enjoyed last week, but she it was very funny because my stepfather, Herman, is from Louisiana. So we talked about him a little bit when we were speaking to Phil. And um, she said, you're always so lovely when you speak about Herman. And I said, well, I love him. And she said, well, I love him too, but I'm not that nice. <laughs> and I said, that's because you're cranky now. <laughs> Poor Herman. He has to put up with Hallmark Christmas movies now from now on because they're sharing one television. Oh, no. oh Terrible. <laughs> And we also had a customer, um, Brenda, who's originally from Missouri, and she had a lovely email um, speaking about Halloween. And she, much, you know, like we talked about, when she first came here to find a pumpkin to carve, she had to spend $60 on one of the orange ones before they sort of became a little bit more mass marketed. And um, she has taken her children home at least twice for Halloween, once when they were little so they could experience it, and once when they were sort of mid-teens so they could experience one of those haunted houses that we were talking about. And, uh, you know, they frighten the heck out of you, and they grab you, and they, you know, it's performance piece. It's not like a scary roller coaster ride here. It is full on. Um, she says it's still a talking point because she knocked her own children down to get to the exit before them. <laughs> and they still make them laugh. Okay. She has sent us some photos of some jack-o'-lanterns. So we'll have to um, get that up on the site. So, or at least on Instagram or Facebook. So people can have a look at their uh, works of art. Yep. We'll get uh, Phil Jr. to do that. He did that last year and we really had some uh, great artists out there. We did. There were some. They, there were some amazing ones last year. Okay, now we're going to go into our favorite part of the show, Matt Nosh. Yum. Today, Wednesday, November the eleventh, is National Sunday Day. Oh, yum. It has to have peanuts on top and whipped cream to be a real Sunday, though. Well, I, you know what I like? I like it with the walnuts that were done in a maple syrup Ooh. and with a little bit of chocolate syrup to go with that. It's sort of, I guess, like a turtle, you know, like the turtle was done sort of like that way. But oh, yeah. My favorite. Hmm. We used to go to an ice cream place. It'll come to me. Uh, my mom will have to tell me the name of it now. It escapes me. And they used to have one called the kitchen sink. It was this giant Sunday that had like a hundred scoops of ice cream in it and bananas and everything. And they'd come out and ring bells. Yeah. And I would try to make my way through that without dying. Yeah. We had that in Brooklyn. Also the name of the place in Brooklyn that the, the kitchen sink was a place called Jan's. Ah. And you would go in there with a group of people. And if you ordered this kitchen sink and again, it just comes out in this big punch bowl, so to speak. And what they were doing also is like somebody ordered an ice cream and they said, no, that's not what I ordered. And as long as they didn't touch, well, hopefully they didn't touch it. They used to put it back in the freezer and that also went into the making. <laughs> bubble, you know. Well, that's, you know, environmentally sound. There's no wastage in that. I kind of like that. Yep. And Thursday, <laughs> Thursday, sorry, Thursday is national pizza with everything. And I, we have here on our notes, except anchovies like, does not like anchovies on the pizza. The uneducated anchovies are fantastic. I can I say everything it. except for pineapple. 
I could definitely go with that pineapple. Yeah. Now, you know, my husband, he hates mushrooms and used to hate olives. When he would go away, the first thing I'd do would order a pizza full of mushrooms, olives, and anchovies. That's a nice pizza. It was the nice thing about buying the there's few nice things about getting pizza here in, in Australia because it's you know much different than New York pizza. But if you order pizza in New York and you want mushrooms on it, they use canned mushrooms. At least over here, they use fresh mushrooms. They, they do. Much, yeah, that, that would be. I like um, or they have the shredded ham on it here, where you know you usually get those pieces. I know we get pieces of can, like Canadian bacon. Yeah or bigger pieces of ham at home. But I like, actually, there's no pizza I don't like. So I could, I would be a little bit sad without the anchovies, but I could still live with it. Yeah, but the good pizza, that what makes the pizza a great pizza is the crust. Oh, yeah. Do you like thin or thick? Uh, I could go for both. Uh, I like the Sicilian one, the thick one, uh, especially the corners. And mm -hmm. I like the thin ones. So I'm happy either way. Just give me a good pizza pizza. But it's the crust that it's all about. That's exactly right. And then we also have National Chicken Soup for the Soul Day. Sounds uh, very kosher to me. <laughs> well, chicken soup, you know, I suppose November, being a bit chillier over there, that's, you know, it's, makes you better when you're sick. Jewish penicillin. Exactly. And <laughs> that with some... Um, Dumplings in it, you know, matzo ball dumplings. Oh, uh, yum. Yeah. Oh, now, this is my day. All on the same day. <laughs> now we've got National Happy Hour Day. Huh. How many hours do we have in, in that day? <laughs> like 12, right? 12 hours of drinking? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a happy hour. So, and, you know, uh, the happy hours, uh, you know, back in the States, you get that little, you know, that little oven that you open the drawers and you might get some, you know, little like cheese balls or little, you know, fried mushrooms or little hors d'oeuvre things to go with your, uh, your drinks. Now, I don't know if they still do that, but there were some places you could go to for a happy hour and you didn't have to bother having dinner because there was just so much stuff that was put out there. Yes, I think I think I um there was a place called Stockton Joe's and they used to do a really good happy hour there and uh the yeah you didn't have to eat dinner after that. <laughs> and and Friday um which is also my mother's birthday, happy birthday mom. Um National Indian Pudding Day. Now this is well I guess they should change it now because it should be National American Indigenous Day. Well, it should. And the reason they called it that originally is because of maize from corn. It's sort of a double boiled corn pudding, not quite a mush, but a corn pudding. I have never had it, but there's not a corn product I don't like. So it's I'm a New England, really. yeah, sorry, but it's a New England delicacy up in probably Massachusetts and Maine and Vermont where they make it. It is a, a quite difficult to make it's a three-step process and when it's finished it sort of looks like maple remember maple no what's well, that maple was a one of the first hot cereals that was mass marketed you know uh, i want my maple <laughs> that, was, that was the, the little catchphrase but it, the difference was they both have like a molasses base and cinnamon and stuff but maple was done with oats instead of with corn. Oh, I remember my grandmother making me cornmeal mush. And I really liked that because it was maple syrup on it. I must have been sick at the time. She did look after me a bit. Um, now, the next day, which is Saturday, the 14th of November, is National Spicy Guacamole Day. Guacamole, great guacamole is nothing better. Nothing and I, and I don't care if I'm paying extra for guacamole. I will pay all the extra. I love it. Yeah. I, I It's just some guacamole. It's just, just one. We used to go to a Mexican restaurant and they would make it in front of you. Sort of like they had the tequila bar. They had the, you know, the, the guacamole bar. And they come out with a little wagon and they cut open. Oh, you know, that's the fancy. They do it all up in front of you. And it's like, oh, this is so good. And then we come to... It's on the same day is National Pickle Day. <gasps> Pickle Day. 
pickles? Do you want do you want sweet sweet pickles? Do you want dill pickles? Do you want slices, wedges, whole? There's so many options. Yeah, I love pickles, but I'm not a fan of sweet pickles. Maybe a bread and butter once in a while, but not the sweet gherkins. I uh, wasn't brought up that way. Just a good kosher pucker up pickle. I love how you get a sandwich back in the States and you have your sandwich and there's the little bag of chips and the wedge of a pickle. Yeah. Well, we can do more pickles next week. Next week, uh, the pickle theme. We will be talking about that, you know, and pickles are all sorts of things like, you know, pickled, we had a customer that I had a little chat with this week and, you know, pickled okra is another vegetable you can pickle. And there's all sorts of, as well as, you know, the little cucumbers, the large ones. We've got uh, the refrigerated pickles from New York, which are fantastic, very garlicky, and different crunches depending on what kind of pickle that you get. Yeah, half sour, full sour. Yeah, goes on. We'll we'll save that one for next week. (laughs) That's right. Now, the next day is a very important day in preparation. This ties in with our theme as well. So Sunday is clean out your refrigerator day. And it's also National Raisin Bran Day. So it's a double clean out. (laughs) That's right. You're clearing the decks for the holidays once and for all. (laughs) Clear it all out. That's it. (laughs) Actually, we have a, uh, my husband named the, you know, the crisper in the fridge. He's called that the rotter because nothing ever goes there to get more crisp. (laughs) It goes in and never comes out or it comes out as a science experiment. Yeah, you just pour it out. And, to, you know, I've thrown away Tupperware before. Too bad I can't throw out the bottom drawer at times. <laughs> and on Monday is National Fast Food Day. Oh, where do we start? Oh, yeah, there's so much good fast food. And sometimes the faster the better. But uh, originally, <laughs> you know, breakfast was always a very slow process. And if you look up fast food and the first fast food, that actually came out being produced and not something that you uh, go to a restaurant and have, or you know, like McDonald's, but was considered fast food was cornflakes because prior to cornflakes, you had to cook breakfast. Oh, that's true. So this is just open a box and pour some milk. And that was fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, and cereal be, had, does become a way of life. I remember being so happy when my kids were old enough to, you know, pour their own bowl of cereal and I could stay in bed longer. <laughs> yes, there is a good staple and there's a lot of history and there's shows that were on the American PBS and been played over here. And I'm sure you could Google them about the, uh, about Kellogg's and Post and the battles that they went through with each other. Uh, at one time they both worked together and then they separated and what went on and then also between the Kellogg's brothers to get the rights to the name. So quite interesting, a lot of history in there, and it's something to uh, Google and look for those shows or even read about the stories between the, the battles of the Serial brothers. Oh, that is true. I will have a look. I, I love a good doco. And who would have thought the first sort of fast health food, it, you can also now get canned chocula. It's sort of <laughs> it's gone full circle. <laughs> Now, one of my most favorite, favorite foods is on Tuesday. It has its own day, uh, National Baklava Day. I love baklava. There's nothing better, it, I, whether it's walnut or pistachio, honey or sugar syrup, any of those, whether it's in a cigar or a wedge, I just love the crunch. It's I know, beautiful. and it's so sweet with the honey. It, you have to have a, an espresso coffee. You can't even have it with, uh, you know, a latte or anything. You need just a black coffee to go with that. That's right. Just a nice little, nice little nip of coffee to take the edge off. But it is magnificent. And all the, you know, the grandmas and yayas, they've got their own recipes and they're all a little bit different from each other. And um, I'm happy to try all of them, actually. Yeah. And we also have uh, National Homemade Bread Day, which we have been lucky enough to experience your bread making because you make a magnificent loaf of bread. Yeah, that was part of the lockdown, you know, and I think everybody else made bread at the time. But one thing towards the end of it that I did find was at my local deli, they had fresh baker's yeast. And the difference of using the fresh baker's yeast as opposed to the dried yeast was just night and day difference. So if you're going to bake any bread, 
search around and try to get some uh, fresh baker's yeast. And then you used, you were playing around with our everything but the bagel seasoning on that as well, which was magnificent. Exactly. That's a very popular product for us now. And my little hint, if you're going to use the everything bagel bake seasoning, when we when I worked in a bagel bakery, the onion and the garlic was always wet. So if you're going to use it on a top of a bread, if you want it to stick, it needs to be wet. So just put the whole thing, including all the seeds and everything, you can't separate it out, and let it soak for 10 or 15 minutes and then rub it into the top of the bread and then get your little knife and do your little serrations. And that's the way to do it because otherwise, one, it won't stick and it will be too hard. Uh, so you do need to hydrate it a bit. Yum. Well, I, yeah, as I said, I've been lucky enough. Phil brings in little treats for us. So we get a few little extra bits and pieces and I'm happy to taste test all of that as well. Yeah. And I was doing the rye bread, which your daughter just absolutely flipped over. And <laughs> the rye bread, my thing of growing up with rye bread, it, it always had to have caraway seeds in it. Yum. I love that. I love that. I'm, it, it was magnificent and I miss, I miss rye bread. Yeah. Well, that almost brings us about the, I think we're at the end of the show here, Bob. Woohoo! I'll have Ooh. to go home and uh, practice my pie making skills. Yeah. And I'm going to have to uh, procrastinate more when I get home. <laughs> That's okay. You'll have a note telling you not to procrastinate. Yeah. I already got six notes already about thing at home, bringing home things for Thanksgiving already. So that's uh, just building up. It's is that it's not too much to ask, Phil. Come on. All right. Well, <laughs> I'll look at my notes before I leave here today, and I'll wish you all a pleasant week. Uh, have a good one, everyone, and don't forget, drop us a note if you have any questions or any ideas. We're happy to hear them all, and um, it's been lovely, Phil. Thanks for uh, sharing some traditions with us. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Thanks for Dave, and thanks for Brendan for our producer there from fizzfarm.com.au. Take care, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>